Hey folks, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio, and we talk about the Beatles here on all of our shows. And all the shows are special, we have lots of special guests, and this time it is no exception. Ever since Danny Lane passed away last December 5th, I wanted to do a tribute show for Denny. And there's no people I'd rather have doing this than the three people that I invited uh, this time out. Three members of Wings, former members of Wings, that all work with Denny Lane. And they've all been guests on my different shows, my radio show, my podcast. Let me introduce all three of them to you. First of all, um, a man who started working with Paul McCartney and Linda on the Ram album. And he was the first drummer in Wings. Uh, appeared on the Wildlife album, Red Rose Speedway, toured with Paul and Wings in 1972 and 73, appeared on Live and Let Die, uh, the James Paul McCartney special, you name it. Uh, Denny Sywell is back with us. Hi, Denny. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Very good, Denny. How you doing? <laughs> good to see everybody. Yeah, all right. A Wings reunion right here. Uh, and Lawrence is, Duber buddy, is with us. My, Oh, yeah. I just go ahead. <laughs> my buddy Steve lives across from my old building in New York. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm just directly across from you, right? Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> I don't think your building's still there, though. They've got some monstrosity they put up with these big outside uh, skeleton. Uh, I don't know. Where were you at exactly? One, one, no, 155 West 68th Street, the Dorchester. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know where That's you are. That's still there, the white. Yeah, yeah. Brick. Yeah. 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 Yeah, very close. <laughs> okay. Yeah, when when I moved to Studio City, Denny was living around the corner. So that's right. Yeah. So you're all closer than we think, in many and ways. Now we're real close. <laughs> as close as we can Zoom, be. Uh, you could do anything on Zoom these days. Yeah. Anyway, Lawrence Juber's with us. Lawrence was there at the end of Wings. It's kind of funny. Our guests were there at the beginning of Wings and the end of Wings. Mm -hmm. Nothing to represent the middle. <laughs> no, except, except Danny Lane and Spirit. Yes, yeah. that's true. And Lawrence, of course, was the lead guitarist in Wings uh, on Back to the Egg, the 79 tour, the single for Coming Up, number one record in the United States. And uh, welcome back, Lawrence. He's been on all my shows. <laughs> it's always great to have him. Well, thanks for having me today. And Steve Holly. Steve goes all the way back with me since the 80s when he was in a band called Reckless Which one? Sleepers. Oh, Reckless Sleepers. That's right. That's right. Is that where we first met? Boy. Yeah. It was like Good the late kid. 80s. Yeah, yeah. Very early 80s, yeah. You wow. were on my radio show in New Jersey on WDJ. Of course. We talked about the new album from Reckless Sleepers with Jules Shear in the band. Yeah. And... Uh, did a Jimmy, lot. Vivino, Jimmy Vivino and uh, Brian Brian Stanley. Yeah, yeah. That was a good little band. Shame we didn't last longer. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll get a Reckless Sleepers reunion on this channel. Uh, I'm playing with Jimmy tomorrow. That's just I haven't seen him for a while. So there we go. <laughs> okay, so for for this show, we're just going to talk about Danny Lane, and all three of my guests will share their memories of him. And what I'd like to know, first of all, we'll start with Danny. Um, when was the first time that you met him? Okay. Well, uh, I was summoned. <laughs> uh, Paul <laughs> called me after Ram was released. And he said, hey, uh, you and your wife want to take a little vacation and just come over to Scotland and hang out. And I thought, wow, what a great way to uh, get over to the Europe so I can see my wife's family. We can go down and see her, her wife's family and niece in the in France. So uh, we said, sure. So we flew over. And actually, I took this set of drums that, that's behind me here mm. on the plane with me. Mm. 1964 Gretches. And we got there and uh, they said, what are you doing with the drums? And I said, well, I'm a friend of Paul McCartney's and he invited us over for a little vacation. He said, well, why the drums? I said, well, I take drums with me wherever I go. <laughs> They were not going to let me in the country. So anyway, I'll make this brief. But I said, call Paul. And he said, yeah, I, I asked for him to come by. And, and I asked him to bring some drums. So they hooked me up with a van. And we went down. And, and um, Hugh McCracken, who was also on the Ram album, was finishing a tour with Gary Wright. 
And he flew into Scotland a day later or something. And we went up to the farm and Paul asked us both if we would like to form a band. And I said, uh, yeah, I'm in. Uh, Huey, on the other hand, said, I, I have to come back uh, 24 hours and give you an answer. And what Paul didn't know, and I didn't know, is he had a prior marriage and he had young kids growing up. He didn't want to miss their childhood. So that's why he said that. And it was quite a shock to Paul. You know, a guy like Paul McCartney doesn't hear no very often, you know. <laughs> it's an invite to join a band. But Paul said, okay, why don't you go back to New York and um, I'll call you when I get somebody else. And he called Denny. And uh, a week or two weeks later, I guess, something like that, he said, uh, okay, I got Denny Lane. So uh, come on back. We'll start the band rolling. So I show up at uh, the hotel in the Argyle Arms and <laughs> in Campbelltown, and we roll up to the uh, – to McCartney's farm and uh, spent a day up there just hanging out, having fun and telling stories and playing a little music. And uh, Denny was one of those guys that uh, just put him anywhere in a caravan, a camper, uh, <laughs> out in the middle of nowhere with a guitar. And he's happy. He was just one of those guys. And so uh, I was uh, the odd man out. Linda was the other American, but she was almost brit at that time mm. <laughs> but you know but i met danny for the first time up there and uh, we actually he had a little dachshund dog called a kid <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and we invited we we had found a farmhouse to rent uh it was a brekkerhe farm called kenzie by campbellton and um we would kind of set up shop a few miles it was easier to, uh, so Denny used to come up to our farm and he'd stay there with us. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was magic. It was just magic. And then we'd get together during the day. We'd, we rented a couple of cars in, in the, in the village before I bought a Land Rover up there, but we rented a couple of cars. And every time we'd go up to the farm to, to, uh, to Paul's farm to hang out and rehearse and stuff, there are these boulders in the, uh, we wrecked a couple of, they wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, rent me any cars anyway. So that's why I put an ad in the paper and I found an old 1953, like an army Jeep Land Rover. And, uh, that served as our, our car to get to and from rehearsals. And it's Paul, had, <laughs> pardon, go ahead. Probably still there. <laughs> he, I gave it to Duncan and Duncan's. Uh, yep. Uh, yeah. Probably and still Paul, had another farm over the hill that was called Low Rannikin. And there was a, a big barn, uh, a house, and down the road a little piece was a cottage. And that's where Denny stayed. And he stayed without electricity or running water or anything. You know, he was like, he just, he loved being on his own and being with his guitar. And he he would have been happy just living in a camper or a caravan, as he called it, you know, he was really, um, I was very surprised when I heard that, that he, he got married. Uh, well, wait, Jojo, we knew Jojo, his wife, and mm -hmm. that he bought a house, a proper house in St. John's Wood. you know, it just wasn't Denny's style at the time, you know. Did you, did you get to see like an instant connection with the band? Did you see the Paul and Denny? There was like an instant because they had history together, yeah. knowing Denny and the Moody Blues. And were you yeah. familiar with with Denny's work prior to uh, Wings? No, I'm an old jazzer from New York. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know anything about anything, really. You know, I went from playing jazz records and commercials and stuff to my first rock and roll band was Paul McCartney. It was really weird. But... Um, uh, you could see right away that that Paul needed a, a semblance of another John. Mm. And they, Denny and Paul uh, hit it off. And you could see that there was a, a a bond there that was pretty inevitable. I mean, that they they could they could just go on and sing songs forever. You know, they they, they knew all of the song, the skiffle songs to Every everything you can imagine, but they they were brothers in arms. They'd gone through the same past and the, growing up in the clubs and all that. So 
I, I accepted that immediately. And Jen, Denny was very cool. You know, we, we used to be called Big Denny, Little Denny, you know, because <laughs> Paul would say, hey, Denny, and both of us would turn around. So, uh-huh. so that was the only problem that we had. But uh, we were up there for a couple of weeks and uh, re- rehearsed up, uh, learned a bunch of songs and went down to London and recorded Wildlife. I mean, it was all done in a weekend, kind of. And uh, yeah, so we uh, we we got along fine, and uh, yeah, I'm really sorry that that his road home was pretty ugly, and uh, I'm just uh, happy that we can make a tribute to him. He was he was a great lad, you know. I'm happy that I got to meet him several times, and I, I interviewed him like two and a half times. <laughs> the half because I was interviewing him, and then he had to go and do a concert. Yeah, but. Uh, no, he was great to hang out with, yep. no doubt about it. Lawrence, the first time you met Denny was when he actually spotted you on, uh, was it David Essex's show? Yeah, because I was a studio musician in London, and I was booked to play lead guitar in the house band for this David Essex TV show. So that was like September of 1977, and each week there'd be a different guest. And like one week we had Twiggy, which was kind of fun. And then we had Ronnie Spector and then Danny Lane. And Go Now, you know, because that was his signature song. And they, they'd written in a guitar solo for me to play. And um, Danny liked what I did. And apparently, uh, according to Richard Niles, who was the musical director, Danny had actually called a few days later to find out if I was versatile, <laughs> which Richard assured him I was. Um, but, but the fascinating thing for me was that i had never seen the the actual performance you know because it was just any at the piano the the studio band were not on camera and after denny had passed i found it on youtube and there's a moment when as i start the guitar solo i i see denny smile and it's like in that moment that was when my life changed because that was like you know, Denny's kind of um, recognition that that I could do what what he thought he could recommend me to Paul for. You know, so that was that was the beginning of it. And then I ran into the, uh, I was at Air Studios, the old Air Studios in Oxford Circus, and I was early for a session. And I'm waiting outside, and there's Paul, Linda, and Denny doing. I think it was Oriental Nightfish, or they were doing a mix of the. Mm. The, the music for that and so Denny invited me in that was when I got to actually meet Paul and Linda although I'd met Paul before on another session when I was went off to the restroom with Herbie Flowers on our musicians union break and there's Paul McCartney zipping up his fly uh, which was the most inauspicious meeting with a with a, a beetle that was um, your initiation I guess it was yeah <laughs> yeah, it was kind of a, a weird kind of baptism, really. <laughs> uh-huh. um, but but the um, I, Denny and I kind of chatted a bit when I ran into him and Paul and Linda, and and then it was mu- some months before I actually got any kind of uh, um, any call about it. I was in, in Abbey Road. I was in Studio Two, and I'd never been up the stairs into the control room because you know when you're a studio sausage you're kind of down you know down in the studio and you I'd never been invited up there and Mm. there was a phone call which was really unusual you know because there were no cell phones in those days and very rarely would one get a phone call um, on a session in fact uh, uh, the only other time it happened was was a month earlier when I was on a um, session and and I got the call that my dad was uh, was in the hospital and had just passed away so you know getting a phone call like that was kind of like you know a little scary Mm -hmm. Uh, and but it was alan crowder uh you know who was kind of the you know day-to-day manager at mpl and he said denny wants to know if you can come and jam on monday and oh by the way paul and linda will be there and that was when that was when i met steve for the first time on the monday and we jammed were you aware that paul was looking for a a league oh yeah Everybody knew that Paul was looking for a guitar player, but I was very established doing what I was doing as a studio musician. And I, you know, wasn't like I'd submitted like cassette demos or anything. Mm-hmm. And the first time that you jammed with Danny, what was that like? 
Well, that was with Paul and Linda too. So, and Steve. I mean, it was just, you know, I think we, I, I seem to remember playing some Chuck Berry stuff and some yeah, record grooves. And, you know, it was like, it was pretty casual. Chris Thomas was there too. I remember that. But, you know, just, just Denny was always so friendly and, and so just, just such a, a cool guy to hang around with. So I felt quite comfortable. I mean, it was a little scary, you know auditioning for Paul McCartney, but it seemed to work out. Yeah. From what I gather from what I think I fit the suit. What's that? I think I fit the suit. (laughs) You did more than that. (laughs) You fit the role perfectly. Um, Would you say, because kind of like what what Denny was saying before, do you feel like Denny was was the anchor in Wings? Outside of, you know, I mean, no, I think, I mean, I would classify it because my perception was it was very much it was Paul and Linda's band. Right. You know, and Denny was was an anchor, but he wasn't necessarily kind of the core. I think he was just the 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 kind of a stabilizing, creatively stabilizing influence. And I think because Denny's musicality, I mean, the fact that he had this this deep kind of soul R&B sensibility, but also this kind of gypsy folky mm. thing, that that combination, I think, was really the thing that that I found so appealing about him was that he could he could pick up an acoustic guitar and, you know, just play the folky stuff or a little Django, but then pick up his Les Paul and, and, and be a rocker and and I think that, that that appealed to me because I had spent so much of my career building up uh, uh, this versatility to be able to play all the kind of different styles that it was kind of, I could relate to the fact that Denny wasn't hmm. just like a one style kind of player. Right. And he recognized so, that in you. Were there, were there times when the two of you would, would, rehearse stuff of different styles maybe apart from wings not particularly i mean the jamming always kind of happened within you know within the whole wings thing i mean it not always i mean i remember when we when we came up with um bits of old siamsa for example steve was playing keyboards paul was playing guitar and i think Lin- it was i think linda was playing drums <laughs> well, well see i don't remember that yeah. <laughs> but I remember you were playing keyboards because that was that chord progression was was one that you threw in there. That's right. Yeah. But uh, but it was really I mean there was kind of this just a, a, a from my perception anyway there was this band sensibility about it and we would we do a lot of jamming. I mean that was just kind of part of the uh, part of the thing and and Denny was always right there, you know. Okay, Steve. Uh, yeah. How did you? get to be a part of Wings. I think a lot of fans may not be aware that prior to working with Paul, you were in Elton John's band. (laughs) Well, yes, sort of. It's, um, it was a complicated year because I had a band called uh, Vapor Trails and we were managed by a chap called Max Hull, who ended up, anyway, that's a whole nother story, but we were doing quite well. And um, I've been, working, the keyboard player was working with Kiki D. So we became her backing band. And when she did her next album, Elton John was producing the record. Mm. And he then asked me if I would be interested in working with him at uh, just one of those times. And so I went in and made the single man album. Around about the same time, Denny bought a house in the village I grew up in. And a good guitar friend, friend, player friend of mine, Nick Pearson, I was working with, great guy, said, you never guess who bought you corner? And I went, well, who? And he goes, Denny Lane. I said, you can't be serious. It was like right in the center of the village opposite the church, gorgeous house. Mm-hmm. And uh, I believe it was once lived in by A.A. A. Milne and Winnie the Pooh had been written there. So it was kind of famous in the history of our little village. Wow. And they said, Denny bought the house. So... I was wandering around and I bumped into him in the local pub one evening. He said, I'm having a party on Friday, um, housewarming party. Um, and people tell me you, you're a good drummer. He said, why don't you come? come but come early. I went, oh, okay, what's early? And he goes, I don't know, 5, 5.30. I went, okay. So 
I wandered up to the house at about five o'clock and the front door was open and I could hear music. And I sort of followed in and I found, came through a passageway and opened the door uh, to see Linda McCartney behind the piano, Paul McCartney playing a bass, Danny playing a guitar and a drum kit with nobody behind it. And I motioned to the, I just, and Danny looked at me and said, I shrugged his shoulders, I don't know. So I sat down and just started playing. And uh, <laughs> the heads turned around and, and we were having so much fun and Paul just went through about 10 different styles, one after the other, said, hey, can you play a little reggae? Can you play a little blues? Can you play a little little? How about, that? you know, old time rock and roll, some Buddy Holly, but just ran through all this stuff. And I was having a blast, just having a great time. And um, then different guests, different folks started to arrive and the meet and greet was getting too much. And Paul and Linda said, uh, hey, yeah, see you all later. It was nice to meet you. And um, one of my favorite stories about Denny comes out of this because we hadn't known each other more than a week or two. And I remember saying to him, you know, Denny, these drums, they're kind of okay, but the and the cymbals are kind of okay, but that ride cymbal there, that's a beauty. That's an old 50s K Zildjian. It's absolutely fantastic. I wouldn't just let anybody hammer away on that, okay? He said, oh, sure, sure, no problem. They said, nice to meet you. You know, it sounds great. See you around. And I went home, which was only about a mile as the crow flies. And uh, in the morning, um, my mom was there and she's making a cup of tea. And I'll never forget this because she she said, oh, could you get the papers in? I opened the front door and the symbol was in the porch of the of our house. <laughs> so sometime in the night, Paul, Denny had found, uh, got my address from somebody, I don't know who and took that symbol around, gave it to me by putting it in. <laughs> so I, I brought that in with the milk and the newspapers. <laughs> and, like, and about 10 minutes later, the phone rang, and my mother answered that, and it, it was uh, Paul McCartney. And my mum dropped the phone, and I picked the phone up and said, can I help you? What's up? And they said, hey, Steve, it's Paul. I enjoyed that last night. Um, listen, do you think you could uh, hold a, a, a good gig, you know, like a big time? I said, well, yeah, I think so. I just finished Elton John's new album. He said, what? He said, can you make your way up to London? That's when we had like a formal audition. So it was uh, really surprising. I mean, out of the blue, completely out of the blue. And uh, the only person that was really upset at the time was was uh, Elton John, who I adored. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, I can't believe you're going to go now. I said, well, how many chances am I, you know, let's be honest, how many chances am I ever going to have to do this? It's not, you know, I said, it's nothing personal. I just, I can't say no. And uh, so that was a, a difficult parting, but yeah. So there were no hard feelings on Elton's part? No, uh, we didn't speak to each other for several years. <laughs> <laughs> but we did get back. Um, I got some tickets in San Francisco and he uh, he actually was really sweet. He came out and he knew where I was going to be sitting and, uh, and he just uh, nodded his head and went back to the piano and played sorry seems to be the hardest word and I was like oh. <laughs> and then someone came and grabbed me at the end of that concert now uh, it's almost a, I think that's the last time I saw him and he just said I'm so sorry I'm happy it worked out for you I'm so sorry for sitting so um yeah very different I mean what a situation to find yourself in at that yeah. I, I don't know how it happened why it happened I'll never really fully understand it but I was very grateful for the time I had there and meeting you guys <laughs> <laughs> It's kismet. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, didn't you think in the back of your mind when Paul's asking you to play all these different styles that this is an audition in a way? I didn't. No, I was just, uh, I didn't, honestly, didn't sense that at the time. I was just like, I was just excited it was happening. I thought this is great fun, you know. I honestly did not consider that until the following morning with the phone call. And then um, by that time, I guess, uh, you know, he must have had some idea. I, I think Lawrence, you you had met him before me meeting Danny, or was it was I? Well, late? I met him that that occasion at, at um, CTS Studios in Wembley was, I think, earlier in '77 when I was working with Herbie and 
and that was when I met Paul in the men's room. <laughs> but it wasn't, you know, but it wasn't like a, a, a real meeting. I mean, it was just, you know, hello kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but, just... but it was really, I mean, the Denny, meeting Denny in, seven, in September. But, you know, I got the call. I mean, this was April of 78 when, when um, I got the call to come in. And that Monday, I think it was like April 22nd or something, somewhere around there, when you and I were both at MPL. Mm-hmm. And, and that didn't really, it didn't feel like an audition. No. It felt more like just kind of a casual kind of jam. And then, you know, when Paul turned around and said, what are you doing for the next few years? Mm. You know, and, and, you know, I had spent my entire teenage years through college and beyond with the soul ambition of becoming a studio musician right so i knew that that by accepting the wings gig i was giving all of that up right we give everything up at that point basically yeah i mean it was really i mean but you know but you know i mentioned earlier you know my my dad had passed away a month before so i was at a point in my life where everything was kind of in flux yeah of course um and i just couldn't turn down to working with Paul. No. It's, it's Interesting, just, yeah. just a, an offer, you know. You mentioned Herbie Flowers. Yeah. Um, who was, RIP, yeah. I had the, uh, the joy of playing with him only a couple of weeks before this all evolved because he, he was playing on a, a track I did with Elton on a single man. Oh. And, and that was phenomenal. It was towards the end of the sessions, but that's a whole other another coincidence there. I didn't realize, but. Yeah, Herbie, Herbie called me Young Larry. He was one of the few people <laughs> I've ever allowed to call me Larry. But mm. it's interesting because I was at the Albert Hall earlier this year because my daughter Ilse uh, that, played there. That's right. And, and I, I remembered that I had played in the, the band for the Eurovision, like the preliminary Eurovision song contest stuff. I think it was, I, I think it must have been it was like 77 or 78. It was somewhere in that time period. And, you know, just went off to lunch with Herbie and just, you know, it it was like life lessons talking to Herbie because he was such a, he had this great manner about him. Um, It's interesting when you think about how we met and how we came to be with, I'm just thinking about this now, listening to you talk about these coincidental meetings with certain people. And I, I again realized that playing with the Kiki D was led to me being with Elton John, which led to, you know, and, I, and you mentioned the Albert Hall. The only time I ever played there was with Kiki D. And she used to do Don't Go Breaking My Heart with a cardboard cutout of Elton, who said, <laughs> I be, I, I'm so sorry I can't be there tonight uh, for your birthday. It was her birthday as well. And then as we started playing the intro to Don't Go Breaking My Heart, the audience at the Albert Hall roared and I couldn't understand what was happening. And I looked around and Elton was walking onto the stage with about 50 red roses in his arms wow. and kind of gave him a good kiss. To, and, and that's the only time that I can remember them that doing that song live. And, and it was literally at the, like a week later when uh, I got the invite to, um, to Denny's house and off all that went. So very strange days. But, yeah. yeah, I just saw Elton John in his final tour, and Kiki D joined him. Oh, we really? Didn't I didn't say. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow. Let me talk a little bit about Denny Lane in the studio versus live. Mm-hmm. I always got the impression, just from seeing him live a number of times, that he really lived for performing. Um, in fact. The, the year that he passed, I saw him in February. He was doing a solo show. It was kind of like a storyteller's kind of thing. And yes. he really loved it. Yeah. And um, I know that he said that when Wings ended, he left because Paul wasn't touring. Mm-hmm. You know, that was the main reason. He was very upset that Paul wouldn't continue to tour, especially after what happened in Japan and John getting killed. Yeah. But... Um, how important do you think that Denny really enjoyed the studio more? Was was he more in love with performing on stage, or was it equal for 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 him? Personally, I think the stage was was where where he 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 shone. Um, I, I I mean, we all it's it's I guess it's the camaraderie of touring. 
that uh, that is fun. You know, you're in the studio, you're creating an album. It's great, or, or a song, whatever it is, a single. It's that's a great a great thing to do. But the touring and being walking on a stage and entertaining an audience is really where I think his heart and soul was. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, he we were recording all the time. He was writing songs, but but being on stage is what I think he liked the most. Mm. Do you disagree? I don't know. I agree. Yep, I agree with that too. Yeah, I remember him kind of grumbling a little bit about just how much time we were spending in the studio and how long yeah. the process would take. And you know, because the thing is that it's so exciting when you're you know when you're tracking or when you're you're overdubbing guitar parts or whatever, and and you're really kind of fully engaged in the creativity, but then. You know, there's there's times when you're not really doing a lot, you know, and in my case, I was just observing and I was learning about engineering and about production and arranging and just kind of treating it as like an education. But I think for Danny, he would just get a little frustrated that. Yeah, he liked to keep the forward motion going. <laughs> yeah. I found, I, I've got some some pictures um, that I took up in Scotland where we were kicking a football or a soccer ball around and Denny had his, his that little Gibson, that L double O Gibson, that sunburst one that he had. And he's playing guitar and playing soccer at the same time. <laughs> that, that, that's an indication of that we can be his happiest time. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah. played soccer um, one day when we were filming that uh, James Paul McCartney and I, you know, being the American, I, they said it was football, so I played a little rougher than the Brits. <laughs> they didn't ask me to come back for a second time. <laughs> no Queensbury rules involved there. Yeah. <laughs> did he get into the recording? Was Did he have the patience to deal with all the work that goes into the recordings? And like you were saying, Lawrence, the overdubbing, all of that, or he just wanted to get on with it? No, I, I mean, he was he was completely dependable when it came to, you know, when you do the work. I mean, we all, you know, Lin, Linda included, too. I mean, the, the focus was there. Um, and, you know, but there were times when, um, you know, I remember we were doing Love Awake and I was playing bass because Paul and Denny were playing guitar. And and it, that was kind of cool because... I, th having the two of them together, both strumming on acoustic guitars, really kind of felt like there was there was a real kinship there, you know. Um, but I think that I, I, I mean, I felt looking back on it, I feel like Denny was a little underutilized on the Back to the Egg album, you know. Even again and again and again was two fragments of songs that were put together. Paul said, why don't you put the two together? Much like No Words on Band mm -hmm. on the Run was another one. Because then he had a lot of ideas, a lot of musical ideas. And, you know, in the course of time, since Wings, I mean, when you think about the number of albums that he put out and the projects, the writing projects that he was doing. Um, but I think there were times when, you know, we could have, I mean, I would have loved to have done more where he and I were playing like harmony guitar parts or something like that, you know, but, but the thing about it is from a lead guitarist point of view, you, you only, you only get a few spots with Paul. It's not like wings was a jam band. Hmm. It's like you, you had, there was only like eight bars to make a statement in or whatever. And so we didn't really go. I'd like to have seen us go a little bit more in that kind of direction. Um, and I think when we were rehearsing the tug of war stuff, that that was the point where, um, because Paul's writing direction had become kind of more pop, you know, but when you look at the you know, average person and, you know, all those, those kind of songs that he was writing for that. But, but we really had the chops of a rock band. And, and that, that, I think that was where the, the kind of divergence was really happening because there's, you know, and Denny wanting to get out and play more. Mm. And, and even, I mean, there was that period when you were working with Denny when he was doing those solo gigs, like in London in 1980, right, Steve? Yeah, we did, we did, a, did quite a few things. Um, I remember uh, one of the pubs I saw you guys in. Yeah, we, we were playing around a little bit. I, I, you know, a lot of it's a very distant memory. I, I've got this in front of me, by the way. So I just, have you seen this yet? 
Oh, I've seen that. Yeah, that's um, Shannon. Shannon did that. Yeah. yeah, Shannon did the painting. Yeah, but it's uh, it's now. It's oh, now, this is your um, time to hide release. Cool. Yeah, this is the tri tribute to uh, to Denny from um, McDonald's Farm, which backed they backed him a lot. The band. They're pretty Scott. good. Yeah, they're very good. Yeah, and uh, and uh, this is now officially an MPL uh, release, mm. which I, I we didn't expect, but. It's been given the uh, okay, so um, it's quite quite a nice treatment. And we have from those one of those shows, one of Denny's solo shows, you have the uh, compare saying, "Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Denny Lane," and we've lifted his harmonica solo from "Time to Hide" and dropped it in onto this recording. So he is actually on there too. The lesson. Oh. So the same harmonica solo that was on "Wings at the Speed of Sound." I I haven't. I haven't actually confirmed whether it's a different performance. I have to find out. I, it, it's either the one that's on Speed of Sound or it's one of the live shows. I'm not clear about that yet. Okay. But I do know it's him, so he, he is there. Bless him. And um, yeah, so I think when it went to when they were looking for the the rights to release this, um, I think it was it was asked who was going to deal with the promotion, and they said, "Why don't you let us do it?" So. It's now an official MPL release. Um, that's kind of nice. It's a classic painting by. Uh, oh, well, Shannon's so great. Yeah, it's a beautiful picture. Beautiful painting. Yeah. If, but, if people who don't know, she did all the the Beatle artwork at the the Hard Days Night Hotel. That's right. Yeah. yeah. She yeah. has her own website with all of her artwork, and it's not just Beatles. It's Elvis yeah. Presley. It's John. Oh, yeah, everybody. Yeah. Quite extraordinary. But, that's available now on CD and any other format. Yeah, it's a CD. I, I'm I, I'm not sure if the official when the official release is, but um, yeah, it's, it would be for his birthday. Yeah, I think I think that's the idea. It's, I think it's released tomorrow. Um, is that the be the birthday or the uh, what is? It? Yeah, the 29th. 29th. Yeah, I think it's out tomorrow. Yeah, that's the disc itself. <laughs> so. Yeah. The way to order it is through MPL, or you can order it on Amazon. Yeah. No. Um, that's a good question. I don't. Let me see here. Uh, yeah. Well, while Steve's figuring that out, <laughs> I, no, I'm terrible. I would, I would like to mention something about Denny in the studio, though, because I was there for the first uh, Wing the Wildlife album, right. which was done like a week or two after we first met. Bang, we're in exactly. London and Abbey Road, and it was just the four of us. Henry hadn't been part of it. was a very, it was Denny had the role of lead guitar mm. until Paul says, No, I'm going to play the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he liked, he loved playing guitar. So, but Denny was like really instrumental in getting that right. Five of those eight tracks on that album were right. first takes. Yeah. It I went. Really? That was one of my favorite albums of all. I played that nonstop when that came out. That album it was it was interesting. It had all those elements in it, you know, like uh, "Love Is Strange," but we had some reggae stuff in there. Yeah. And uh, and Paul was trying to write rockers because he knew that we were going on the road. We I think we I'm not sure if we'd done the university tour or we were about to do it, but uh, anyway, he was thinking in his mind he was writing material of. You know, trying to get songs like Soily and The Mess I'm In and, and trying to write rockers. And then all of a sudden he says, oh, let's do Mary Had a Little Lamb. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's always a little, uh, where'd that come from? Yeah, a little offbeat, yeah. Uh, but Denny was wonderful. He was, uh, you know, he just, uh, the, that album was was particularly, it was like, given the world a, a brand new look at a, at a new band. And we were a band. It wasn't Paul McCartney and Wings. It was Wings. Right. And I, I didn't realize this till much later, after I left, actually. But he wanted that band, Wings, to be like Beatles. And right. we'd have to go to the press office and take pictures and do interviews. And he wanted the general public to know each one of us like, like they knew John Paul Henry, you know, John Paul Henry and George. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying. But I, anyway, it was really, uh, yeah, Denny was an, a very big part of that. And boy, when when he played bass, he played bass on Live and Let Die. We did it live. And he was really, 
um, he was more than a fair bass player. He was, he was on top of the money, man. He was, he really was it's great. And his lyrics and, uh, you know, when you'd, he used to come stay at the farm every once in a while and just, uh, you'd see him out there sitting on the rock, you know, overlooking the ocean and stuff mm -hmm. and singing some, making up a song or something. He, he really had a gift. He really yeah. had, and that, that's what, you know, I'm, I wish uh, there was more to remember other than, you know, go now and time to hide and stuff. They were, they were, they were really, really wonderful pieces, but, uh, yeah, he had a he had a, 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 a like Lawrence mentioned. It's kind of a, a gypsy thing that was so much a part of him, and, you, and it showed up in all of his. Uh, yeah, he loved and touring. I I do remember a time after, kind of when it was fairly obvious that uh, the road wasn't going to continue for for Wings for, and then he had some spare time on his own. We did put a band together to do a tour, uh, which is all sort of post wing stuff really and uh i mean one it's a kind of it's just a little silly thing that he did that just reminds me so fondly of his sense of humor is we planned a tour of norway and he bought all this this new vehicles and we had all the equipment we had the band we rehearsed and we were ready to go and he's saying well let's look at this map a second because the first gig's here and the second one's there what do you reckon that will take? And I said, well, I've been to Norway a few times and it's very mountainous. I, I would I would say that's about seven, eight hours probably. <clears throat> and he said, well, hang on a minute. <clears throat> it's only two and a half inches. I think we could do that. In <laughs> 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 it's only two and a half inches. We could do that in three hours probably, you know. And I, I remember getting there, we're going up and down mountains and we got to the club about 10 minutes after we were supposed to have started, you know. And it, it was just it was just such a, a rollicking ride with him. That was the thing. And it was a, a lot of devil may care attitude about him, you know? And um that kind of loose sense of freedom and whatever happens, happens. It it, it made him and, and in some ways like took him to pieces as well. But he was so much fun. That's all I can say. I, I enjoyed every moment. It was never a dull moment around him, that's for sure. That word yeah. gypsy is is been used. I, I the first time I interviewed him, he used that word a lot, and he described his gypsy background and how he wrote "Deliver Your Children," which has that kind of I don't know, yeah. flamenco kind of sound to it. <laughs> would you call it that? But yeah. um, how did he feel about his own songwriting? Because I've heard that he was insecure about it, and yet during the whole Wings period, he released an album, Ah Lane. Mm -hmm. 1973 which was all of his own songs and yet in wings he was limited with what he could write and also um and i have to bring up the the incredible book the mccartney legacy volume one for which we have to thank denny here because of his diary and his My wife, wife monique, she had the monique yeah. had the diary <laughs> but it actually says here in the book that denny was still under contract with former Moody Blues manager Tony Segunda and Denny owed him money and complications with any song Denny would write with Paul. They were complications. Um, and Paul was uh, facing scrutiny with Northern songs. Paul was under contract until February 1973. In case you're wondering why they didn't write songs together, the first one was No Words, McCartney mm -hmm. and Lane. But was he secure about his own songwriting? Because I remember him telling me that around the time of London Town, which is really where he got the most songwriting on a Wings album, he co-wrote five songs with Paul. Mm -hmm. and at the same time, Mullock and Tyre, to add to that. Mm -hmm. So in those early years, especially, did you sense that he was confident about his songwriting? Was he frustrated that he didn't get more of his songs in or, or what, Denny? I didn't hear that from him. I mean... He, I felt that he was very confident about what he did. Mm. It's just really hard when there's there's an entity like Paul McCartney in the room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It takes all the oxygen away, you know. Uh, yeah, you you let Paul shine through. But I never felt that he was uh, not confident about his own writing, you know. No, I never, I never got that feeling. I, I always thought he was, he was he would just come up with stuff on the spur of the moment sometimes it was so great 
And then, you know, 10 minutes later, forget about it. And then, you know, they did the next piece and it might come back a month later. There was a lot of that. But I, I think that um, I, I I think he was fairly confident about everything he was doing. I, I just I think life itself took a took a bit of a, a toll on. Well, it takes a toll on all of us to some degree. But yeah, I think he was he just in, enjoyed being he was frivolous sometimes. He was a devil, devil may care attitude about him. He was just kind of, he wasn't as quiet and considered as a lot of people might be. He was just always living right. like the edge. Um, I, I, I kind of respected that, understood it. I thought at times it went too far and I'd be worried about him, but, but he always seemed to land on his feet and uh, he just had such a tremendous sense of humor. Um, that's the thing I remember about him most. And we, we laughed till we could. I mean, we just couldn't stand sometimes from laughing so much. You know, it was it was great. I mean, he was, he was a great friend and an ally. And I remember him in my little apartment here <laughs> for my birthday one evening. <clears throat> and we just had fun till the sun came up. <clears throat> just playing cajon and guitar and singing and wailing. And it was hysterical, you know. Hmm. But I had a great, great Great, nothing but great experiences. We never, we never fought. You know, disagreed once in a while, but it was never a, never a fight. And I basically had him to thank for so much. I mean, I, I wouldn't have been anywhere near Wings had it not been for Denny. There's no and question. You too. Yeah. yeah, and you too. I think that you know, it's interesting because you brought up the his songwriting contribution to London Town and the, mm. how much of that because London Town is probably the folkiest yes of the of the Wings albums and you know that element I think was just so strong in him and and and, I, and, and that that was the thing that always struck me when I first started playing around London and I'd like open at, at the Fishmonger's Arms in Wood Green in North London with for Al Stewart or Martin Carthy and people like that and and the the self sufficiency of those those folk musicians that could just get up with the guitar or sometimes with no accompaniment you know and and the monitor system was sticking your finger in your ear. You know, that's how it <laughs> itself better because there was no PA. Um, and I think Danny, you know, Danny really had elements of that. Um, but I think that I, I didn't see any, any lack of confidence in his songwriting. I think that the production side of things could sometimes defeat him because there were times when he, like, I remember him talking about when they made um, um, Say You Don't Mind, mm. you know, his recording of it. Um, the, there just was never enough time to do, to do what he really wanted with it. And, and I think that, that had he been kind of fully produced by somebody, you know, like a Rick Rubin or somebody that, that really understood the genre, that, that he could have uh, made his, you know, a different kind of masterpiece. Good different. point. Very valid point. Yeah, I agree with that thousand percent but there's no no shortage of talent there i actually have a a, a song uh, a song called another world that he was over here uh one time and and as he was leaving i said you got any songs and he said well i got this one and he had a bit of a cold um and i i sat him down at the keyboard and and just ran like pro tools and with a click and said play and then had him throw a vocal on it and it's just, it's such a cool song. And I don't know if we can ever do anything with it because I kind of cooked it up with some strings and, you know, um, and I, I talked to, to Liz about it. And apparently Denny had recorded it in another environment and had given the song to some charity for a fundraising thing, but we never did find out exactly what the circumstances of that were. Hmm. But I've got that sitting on my hard drive, you know, with, with kind of like, you know, stars around it. Cause it's just, quite magical and that was the last time i actually worked with him in that kind of studio context mm -hmm. we were talking just before about the songwriting aspect and i was asking if there was any sense of frustration on on denny's part in wings i know that uh denny we've talked about red rose speedway and how originally it was going to be a double album and one of the things that you really wanted was that it would showcase all the band members and you got Linda doing a song, you got yeah. Danny doing a song, and it turned out to be a single album. And from what, what I understand, it was because the record company only wanted Paul songs. 
Right. You know, so on the one hand, I'm sure that Denny loved being in the band and he loved to write music and he wanted and Paul wanted all the members to be established, as you said. Yeah. But then what do you do when the record company is telling you it must be this way? And it really kind of, you know, it stood in the way of Wings getting more established with all the different band members. When Wings at the Speed of Sound came out, oh, the band members got a lead vocal. So that was more in line, I think, with what Paul wanted. Well, I mean, when uh, we were set to release a double album, which was, I thought, pretty cheeky, actually, to a pretty new band, the second album be a double one mm -hmm. at the time. So when EMI said, uh, we'd like to just keep it to, to a single uh, album, we all looked at each other and said, well, that really makes sense. There was no big discussion about that. Let's pick the best. And that was the hardest part because we had, there was all kinds of uh, weird stuff. I still have the acetates mm. of, of the, the, the double album, the, the proposed double album. And there was a lot of good stuff on it. And it came out over time, different, different ways. But uh, uh, yeah, it, it was fun picking the best stuff to make Red Rose Speedway a special album, you know, and Paul did have a, a lot to say about like like Lauren, Lawrence mentioned to say you don't mind and I I would only smile I could only smile and uh, because we were in that mode of the band being in a, Paul wanted us in on everything especially the production he wanted our input we, he wanted there were four hands on the mix I mean we were all there we had our assignments on the faders and we'd be there at three o'clock in the morning mixing with Paul and. And the engineer, it was just amazing how but everybody was a part of that thing on the especially on the on the wildlife album. And then it loosened up a little bit as other producers started to show up and what have you. But yeah. but yeah, uh yeah, and I think just seeing you guys here, the last time I was together with Steve and and Lawrence and I, we were playing at Beetle Fest, one of these best for Beetle fans things. And, and it was the first time, it's one of the most fun times I've ever had in my musical career playing with Steve Holly playing double drums. <laughs> it, it was just phenomenal. Uh -huh. it, I played with double, I played with Jeff Picaro, I played with a lot of different drummers, but this was something really. And then Lawrence and Denny and I, did a couple of them before Steve came into the picture. Then we had four of us, but when it was just Lawrence and Denny and I doing some Beale Fest things, um, it was really good. That's great. We talked about, we talked about, well, maybe we should, you know, let's carry on the legacy a little bit here with the wings. So I called Paul up and I said, Hey, uh, how, how do you feel about us? The three of us going out and representing wings again and going out and playing some wings music. And he said, well, it's it's all right as long as you don't use the word wings. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to I wanted to call it three wing circus, which I thought was brilliant. <laughs> three wing circus. Yeah. Oh, man, that would have been ideal. But uh, yeah, they yeah were have, right now I have my band with um, I have Jeff Allen Ross and, and Bill Sinke and, you know, that that combination. So when we do my my wing show, it, I call the band Airfoil. Because that gets me, gets encompasses wings without actually mentioning wings. Right. Yeah. 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 But well, yeah, man, the, the, I think the with... thing that always struck me about when we, when any of us would get together, whether it was me and Steve and Denny or Denny Lane or or me and Denny and Denny, the how how much it really just felt like it it was like no time had passed. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. that it was just. It, it, that we were just in a continuum, a mm. musical continuum that that didn't matter that it might have been twenty or thirty years. It was just still forty it, or fifty years. It, it all just made sense, you know. Yeah. Well, you all have that connection, and yeah. hey, I would have been the first one in line to see a reunion <laughs> with you guys. So, yeah. um, I want to talk a little bit about the harmonies of Wings, and there's no doubt about it that a signature sound is Paul, Linda, and Danny harmonizing together. There's so many incredible songs, especially everybody points to silly love songs. I always loved 
Little Lamb Dragonfly, which I know you had a lot to do with the arrangement of the harmonies, but did they work really hard on those harmonies or was it just so natural for them? It was very natural. Uh, I remember we were at Trident one day and we'd, we'd done Little Lamb, Lamb Dragonfly in New York for Ram. Mm. And, and somehow or another, you know, we there was like Lawrence mentioned, there was a lot of jamming and fooling around in between actual work. And sometimes that was inspirational. That was what got us to the work that we at hand, you know. And Paul was sitting down at the piano and he started playing some of the uh, Little, Little Lamb Dragonfly and I and I just I was sitting next to him and I said, hmm, wow, we should really finish that. And he said, yeah, I don't know what. And I started and I'm not a singer. I mean, it's like when I sing, it's like a foghorn just appears, you know. <laughs> but anyway, you know, I started singing some background parts. Uh, they were just answering the, the lyric, as it were. And he said, wow, that's really good. And then pretty soon. The whole band was down there. We're, we're, we're arranging background harmonies, and, and we finished the song that day. And I still think it's really a nice piece of work, though. And I, you know, I had nothing to do with the writing of anything because the lyrics were there. Mm. But it's just putting in some background harmonies that were answering the lyrics. It was as simple as that. And I don't know why it took him so long to get to that place. But, uh, yeah, it's, it really turned out nice, though. So. So just so people know, I'm figuring the answering part is like when you hear I'm flying, can't you see me? I'm flying. That came from you. Yeah. OK, that's a great contribution to the song. Sometimes yeah. it's the little things like that that I'll, make all the difference. I'll take anything. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, the thing that, that really took the work was just actually recording the vocals, you know, be, and layering, you know, when you're multi-tracking stuff like that and the, the trick was also you know back in the the analog tape days you had these dolby noise reduction things where you would record it like on cassette players had like mm. dolby on them for those that remember uh, but you would if you would record with the dolby in but play it back with the dolby out because what the dolby noise reduction would do would be to add this kind of high-end like a like a little almost like an oral exciter kind of thing so playing it back without it, you got this shimmer in the high end that just added an extra little, extra little flavor to it. But you know, I remember well, hey, that that was the difference between early and and later wings because the early stuff was done quick. We yeah. um, we really and the, the the only tricks we used were, I he'd ask me to get up in the booth and listen to the vocals when they were doing background vocals. And I'd say, okay, let's get a let's get a blend, and we get a good blend. And I said, now uh, let me let me hear that back. And I said, that's pretty good. Let's double track it. Mm -hmm. So we would double track it, and then I would say, wow, the double track was so much better than the original. Let's double track the double track, <laughs> and that's how we did it. So uh, and Paul had this beautiful thing. Rather than fix a mistake, it was explore the accident. Ah, uh, yeah. I heard him say that. Yeah. We, had, we went through that a couple of times, yeah. yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. I mean, the vocals were just, they were so organic, and I believe that's that's what really made it work. Yeah, I, I always <laughs> refer to mistakes like that as perverse inspiration. <laughs> well, and like it's it. really, I mean, it's, but it's, you know, Miles Davis would kind of go that way, where, you know, sure. yeah, play yeah. a wrong note, but it became a right note because yeah. it's what you what you do with what you do with the mistake that turns it into something unique yeah, yeah. move everything else to to work with the mistake yeah <laughs> did you see danny make suggestions as to vocal parts at all or did that kind of come from paul or did they once they knew the song they kind of knew what they wanted instantly i uh, i what's what, what sorry i don't know who that's got oh, that was for you steve i believe right i don't know <laughs> okay. I, I think it was, it was a collaborative effort. It's a collaborative question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we all we've all sung on on, but I, I would I would definitely hear parts, uh, and I do remember singing. I I I can pinpoint it now, but I I would often hear a tune and hear a harmony and add. I, I, I'm pretty sure I sang on some stuff. I don't remember for sure, but um, 
I do remember singing a lot. I love to sing. So do you remember when we were at the Lim Castle when we were doing the videos for Back to the Egg? Yeah. There was one day where I I showed up early and then Paul came in and he and I started jamming and we ended up like laying down a kind of a drum and guitar track, which then turned into a tune called Robber's Ball. Right. Yeah. It's that. almost like a little opera or something, and we're all singing all these different parts. <laughs> we noble men of Halifax will have you know for two brass tacks that we're much better than the likes of you. And <laughs> naught can beat us northern lads, the spitting image of our dads, especially when we've had a pint or two. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, no, no, no. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> I guess so. When's the last time you heard it? And your memory is that? Uh, it's on it's on bootlegs i'm sure oh i know <laughs> i've listened many but there was also i mean w during the back to the egg sessions we had one day when we did the the rupert the bear stuff hmm. yeah and that was you know paul played piano on a lot of that yeah so we started he was lamb. playing and that was all pretty much done live i believe lamb, little lamb dragonfly was meant to be for rupert the bear uh, the bear yes could be yeah that too yeah when I think about harmonies, because you were just talking about wildlife, I mean, some people never know. My God, the harmonies oh. are gorgeous on there. And Ooh. Love is Strange. And Tomorrow. Yeah. Wow. It's amazing stuff on there. Yeah, it really was. Yeah. Some people, there's an interesting thing. Some people will never know. The day we recorded that, I still didn't have a car. I'm living in this shitty apartment in South Ken. <laughs> And I'd get out and I'd get a cab up to Abbey Road. And there's a guy standing on a street corner with a long plastic tube. Oh, yeah. What do they used to call those things? I don't know. But I, I, I said, stop. <laughs> I went and I bought one of those things and took it up to the session. And, and we just finished. Some people never know. And I, I said, do you mind if I try an overdub? He says, yeah, go ahead. And it's, it's on the take. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it was cool. I think it's called a bull roarer. I'm not sure. Hang on. Google it. GTS. To the, door, to the Google. The bull roar, I remember, but I thought that was a, it is a similar process, though. Yeah, similar thing. Oh, no, no. That's actually, it's more like a, a kind of a, uh, a a boomerang on a piece of, on a piece of string that you. Yeah, call. that's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember that thing. <laughs> Let's so go back to those early years. How did um, Danny react to the rise of Wings as they were getting bigger and bigger? Was it exciting for him? Did it matter to him? Or was he just happy to be in a band and doing what he loves doing? I think he was happy to be in a band because he had a couple failed attempts. There. <laughs> like balls never got off the ground. And uh, he told me some stories about Air Force. And, uh, mm. you know, it, it, this, things weren't working out. And he was having a rough patch. And when... when um, when the chance to to join Wings came along, uh, I think he understood this is this is really uh, the best thing that could happen for me right now. So, yeah, he reveled in it. Yeah, and when did when Paul would do the really odd track here and there, like one of my favorites. I know you'll like this, Denny. Is Loop? <laughs> Loop first ending on the moon. Such a weird track, and you just mentioned yeah. Robber's Ball. Was Denny into all that stuff? Sure. Did he like, oh, did he he like the weird Paul stuff did. that Paul did? or did... The ride. It was supposed to be, there was another one called Night Out that was Paul's version of what he thought jazz was. And <laughs> Denny was right there, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Luke, first in the on the moon, was so weird. Boom, boom, do, 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 you know, it was really a strange track. And we had a ball recording it. And Danny was into it as, just as much as all of us were. Now, I did a version of that on my jazz record, uh, and it's actually a jazz uh, version of Loop First Indian on the Moon. Where does that come from, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so when, when Talk, it comes talking of jazz, I mean, just, yeah. just on that thought that, you know, one of the things with Back to the Egg and that period is that there's kind of a lot of latent jazz in what Paul was writing. You know, there's like, even, even on Good Night Tonight, the, when he goes to the five chord and it's like, it's like a, a B7 flat nine, 
or on uh, Arrow Through Me, where he's got all these 13th chords going on, that he's just kind of exploring harmonic stuff that in that kind of that continuum of Paul as an artist. And I think that the, to some extent you have this kind of a, a little bit of a dichotomy that you have this, this timeline of Paul McCartney as artist, and then you have Wings as his, that project during that period and Denny kind of finding his place within that. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the Denny as the rocker, and Denny as the folky, and Denny as the jazzer, all had kind of their, their, their moments within within that timeline. Yeah, yeah, segments. Segments of Denny and everything. Yeah, you can blame it on me. I put that in my contract to have some jazz in there. You know? There you go. <laughs> yeah, it all started. You say, what contract? <laughs> <laughs> And then there's the jazz intro that you that you gave to Baby's request. Oh well, well that you know, because we were doing a demo for the for the Mills Brothers. So yeah. you know, I just channeled my inner Barney Castle for that. <laughs> um, and was, they they wanted to be paid to record it. Is that what? Yes, they did. Yeah. Yeah. But but that was you know we we laid it down as a demo, and and when it came to the 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 solo section on that, you know, Paul talked about having a trombone, and I said, well, you know. In Studio A, we were in Abbey Road, and it, like Studio One, Don Lusher is in there, who's like one of the greatest trombone players in the world. And Paul said, no, I'll do it on the mini Moog. <laughs> <laughs> so he did like a synth thing, you know. Yeah. All right. Uh, can you talk about maybe favorite memories of Danny outside of the recording and the touring, just on a personal level? If there's any stories you might want to share with us? Mm, hadn't thought about that. Mm. Um, plenty of plenty of road warrior stories, but that you know, I I, I think um, some of the solo tours that that I did with Denny outside of the wings there was some there was some magical moments, uh, but it, they're sort of hard to describe because they were so much in the moment. I I can't really. He he was such a he could be an incredible party animal at times. That was for sure, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, just just keeping up was difficult on occasion, but um, his he just he had so Go much. On, tell about the story up in the farm. Go on. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> the all nighter. Huh? The all nighter. <laughs> oh oh, what was, was that? Danny there? Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> oh, was Danny there? Was Denny there? Which all nighter? We had so many of oh. them. <laughs> okay, that's good enough. Yeah, I, yeah. Do, I do. Do you remember when when he got busted for speeding in his Ferrari, and I think he was doing like 160 miles an hour or something. Oh. That's what they booked him for, and he said, "No, I was actually doing." Oh, that was sure. That was uh, it. Was Danny uh, Tony Secunda's wife was driving this this Ferrari and they were coming down from the north and, and they hit traffic around London and she had a slow down. And then he was in the back seat reading a newspaper or something. And the cop pulled up along the, he said, you're lucky that you made it through six constabularies before you hit traffic. So I can't arrest you, but you were doing 160 miles an hour. But this was this was a subsequent thing where Denny, I think, was driving on his own and and got bust because he oh. lost his license. And then he had didn't he? He had a Bentley that had been rear-ended and it turned into a pickup oh, truck. Yeah, that was beautiful. Yeah, yeah. he had yeah, a Denny, Denny in cars. Yeah, he was one of a kind. Yeah, he I, was. I found this picture of Denny and I. Uh, it's, there you go. Uh, when it was that? in a pub. In a pub after a Ken Dashow interview in New York, <laughs> one of the last times I saw Denny. But then he would play out here at Bogies and different places with his. He had a little pickup band out here, and he'd he'd ask me to come play "Live and Let Die" with him, and that that was always, uh, you know, that was always special. You know, he was there with all that madness. Yeah, he was a special guy. Yeah, he was at uh, a Beatles convention in in uh, Connecticut. Eh, it's over ten years ago, and uh, Charles Rosenay put it together. And um, the band that my son is in, which is a Paul McCartney tribute band, they got to back up Denny, and my son played the drums and 
he loved his drumming and he gave him the thumbs up on Live and Let Die. It was really a great experience and a great memory that that my son could share and I could share. But uh yeah. Yeah, there yeah. was a there was a Beatle Fest in Chicago when um my daughter Ilse was probably about fifteen or so, and she was she started off as a drummer. And there was and on the Saturday night, uh, Mark Hudson, as Mark Hudson was getting up to do a few songs, and I said, Ilse's gonna play drums. And Mark kind of turned white or whiter. <laughs> And then, but she nailed it, you know, because he did this transition from like, oh, oh, darling, I forget what it was, but it was like a medley of two songs that had kind of a tricky transition and she nailed it. But I left because I had another gig on the Sunday. The next day, she got up with like Denny and Mark and I think Mark Rivera and was playing drums with them. And I was so proud of her for that. Right. Because you know, she could always hold her own with the, uh, with, with the guys, you know. You know, just as an aside, Jelly Roll's album is number one this week on Billboard. She has seven songs on it, including a feature. Uh, wow. Hashtag Proud Dad. Wow. Oh, yeah. Wow. Congratulations to her. Wow. Thanks. Yeah. That's fabulous. That is fabulous. Well, I don't know if I should talk about this or not, but um, recently, Paul and I have been, since Denny passed, Hmm. Paul and I have been a lot closer, you know, and uh, we text and talk to each other pretty regular now, more than we did anyway. And me being the first guy from the Ram period, you know, and uh, the other day he said, well, I wanted to come up to the rehearsal. So I went up to the rehearsal. I, I said, pick a good day and I'll come up and just say hello to the boys here. See you guys and everything. So, so anyway, I went up to the rehearsal and we sat around. They were outside the rehearsal studio having some lunch and, uh, Paul and I started talking about Denny and talking about the old days mm. and the band. This band has been with them 22 years. Yeah. I couldn't believe that. But, uh, you know, they were they sat around like kids listening to all of these stories, you know, and, and it was just beautiful. And what wrapped that up was I left the band 51 years ago. And it's one of the biggest mistakes I ever made in my life without, you know, following through with a few things. But it was one of my only regrets. And uh, it turned out that that day at the rehearsal, you know, um, I was trying out Abe's new drums and uh, Paul heard me play drums and just strapped on the bass and uh, got in my face. And and there we were. The magic was our against. <laughs> when that little jam stopped, I said, well, as long as we're here, do you mind doing Live and Let Die for one more time for me? Uh -huh. uh, that's fabulous. And he ran over to the piano and he, when we were young, and there it was, and it was a, uh, the it was like it was well, like we did it on stage the night before. It was a, uh, it was it, quite thanks, amazing. Thanks for sharing that too. I really yeah. love. That's lovely. It was, it was, it was really incredible. Yeah. Yeah, What's it was it? funny because I was, I was there, I was at, um, at on the the campus of uh, in Burbank. Oh wow. Getting, getting my guitar fixed because they have oh, like wow. a vendor building there with Paul Reed Smith and Gretsch drums and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leaving, I see Brian Ray driving in in his Lucid, followed by Rusty in his Tesla. And so yeah. I was chatting with them and then Paul shows up, you know, and, and so we had a nice chat. But I mentioned that Hope, my wife Hope, had a, a Hallmark Christmas movie that was about to air. And, and Paul said, oh, yeah, I mean, me and Nancy, we love those. <laughs> I guess that's... Uh, their secret, secret passion is is Hallmark Christmas movies. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about because we don't know much about Elizabeth, and you mentioned uh, Lawrence Liz earlier, who Denny married six months before he passed away. What, have you met her at all? Uh, well, I knew her from Beetlefast. Uh -huh. She, you know, when, when she and Denny first got together, the Hope and I had um, chatted with her at the fest. But I went out for the funeral. Hmm. I, I flew to Florida. And actually, I played, I played Go Now. I played a solo acoustic arrangement of Go Now during the, during the, the ceremony. Um, so, uh, you know, I haven't spoken to her much recently, but, um, but, it's just so sad that they got married and then he got sick so quickly afterwards. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it was complications from COVID. It, it, yeah, long term. Yeah. yeah. Did you uh, did you know Elizabeth at all, Steve? Yeah, we did very well. Uh, <clears throat> very well. We still stay in touch. Actually, um, that's uh, you know that's a little bit about this CD as well because the the proceeds will go to Elizabeth and Denny's children, whatever that manages to uh, raise. Um, every penny of it will go to them. So um, hopefully it will do very well, but I don't know who's going to be con controlling the, the advertising end of it. But, yeah, we stay in touch with, with Liz, and, um, you know, she's lovely. It's just, it's just so horrible the way it went down. We, we were in touch all the time. I, I remember the last conversation I had with Denny, and then he was unable to talk, and then we exchanged a couple of emails, and that was, that was it. And... Um, uh, you know, quite honestly, um, I have a huge debt of gratitude to him, and uh, yeah, it chucks me up thick. <laughs> yeah, sure. <clears throat> yeah, um, we we were like little warriors for a while, you know. The, <clears throat> I think the stuff outside that we did later was just the trekking across Europe was hysterical. Every every, every single day, it was fabulous, and. Um, you know, we had a good time within Wings, but the, the stuff outside of it was, I can remember, it was just so much fun. I'll, I'll never forget that. And uh, it was a very special friendship. And I saw him quite, quite close to the, at the end in, uh, in New York when he had a solo performance here in the city. And we got to spend some time there, but that was the last time I saw him. And um, we stayed in touch with chatting and then, it went quiet, and I knew what was going on, and I unfortunately could not get down there. Um, I was hoping to be down there with Lawrence, but it was impossible uh, for one reason or another. But, you know, um, I will treasure that friendship <clears throat> for the rest of my life. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Apart yeah. from all the great music that he gave and the contributions to Wings and all of his other music, he was a recruiter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wings, and, and that's why... You guys yeah. are in the band, Steve and Lawrence. Yeah, changed yeah. my life. Yeah, completely. Yeah, but you know the irony is that because Denny left, the official breakup date of Wings is is April twenty seventh of nineteen eighty one, which was the day that Denny officially left. Steve and I were pretty much out of it at that point because we had worked in January uh, on the cold cut stuff, and then I moved to New York, but. But I met Hope on April 28th. Oh. So, you know, the very next day after the official end of it. Mm. So, and, and I was, so, uh, some years ago, I was doing a, um, I was playing at the Pizza Express Jazz Club in, in Soho. Mm. And if you're sitting on stage, the wall that you're facing, if you were to knock through that wall, you'd be in the basement of MPL. Uh -huh. And it was the anniversary of, of the day that we did the audition there. So it was like kind of weird cosmic stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Did you have any say at all? Did you have any input with Cold Cuts? I mean, it never did come out officially. But so many of those songs have trickled out on archival releases. A Love for You, which you worked on during Ram, Denny. You know. Yeah, which I apparently, and I had overdubbed some slide guitar on it. Um, in January of, of 81, because I got a phone call from MPL saying they're putting it in a movie. And my name right. was on the uh, my name was on the track sheet. You know, I didn't remember having done it, but I think I played some piano on that. You could have done so. Yeah. I think I remember playing some kind of little octave thing on the end. Yeah. That was uh, the in-laws. But it's funny because the first track that we worked on was same time next year. Mm hmm which we did at Rack Studios, um, Mickey Mouse Studio. And then the very last track we worked on was Same Time Next Year, because <laughs> they did a remix of it during the, the Cold Cut session. Um, yeah. Okay, so before... You know, a, lot, a lot of water under the bridge since then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how much you can say, and if you can't say anything about this, I certainly understand, but have the three of you been approached for the Man on the Run documentary? Yeah. The 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 uh you didn't didn't you get interviewed for it, Steve? Not that I remember. 
it was because there's no there was no video it was just audio when, when was this i don't this was recently no i think i, I thought you did danny did you yeah i no i'm sure yeah, you did steve yeah, yeah over at Artie rip studio uh, yeah. Studio and, yeah we did it we did it here yeah um maybe but, I have um, absolutely no memory of it do you they're coming there it's it's uh all I know is that it's it was approved by MPL. Yeah. And, Paul, yeah. and uh, they asked me in a very uh, nice way <laughs> uh, to come in and, and do an interview. And I did a complete, the guy's name was Morgan, I believe. That's right. Oh, yeah, 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 you're right. I did. He, he, was, he was very, did you do it, Steve? Morgan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you did do it. Yeah. He was very knowledgeable. And I felt yeah. very comfortable uh, talking to him. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, I do want to, I, you know, they, they really want to know some of the actual factual stuff that happened in the early days, because I was there in the very beginning of it. Yeah. And, uh, and I thought it was my duty to say it in as nice a way as possible. But having lost Denny the way we have, uh, I asked them now if I could review my interview and make sure that I didn't say anything that I would be uh, uh, regretful have, to have having done said, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, but I think this is going to be a bang up. Uh, I spoke with the producer just recently. She came over to the house here to look at some of the some of the footage that I had and stuff. And uh, I think it's going to be quite a gangbuster. Yeah, they, yeah I know they, they're, they're going to license at least one of my pictures in there, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 going to be good. Well, but it's that style of documentary now where you don't it's not talking heads. You know, you're not on camera being interviewed. It's all audio. Mine was the camera. You had a camera? Yeah, yeah. They, they tell me that they weren't using um, video footage. They may have changed it. But yeah, we had a lot of noise in the building that day. That's what I'm not sure if they can actually use anything we did. It was one of those days when I was sitting in the apartment. Oh, no, we, we got plugins for that. Yeah, yeah. That's I, the noise right out of there. <laughs> I don't know whether they'll be able to use anything we did. But it was, it was incredible. Yeah, I think it was like all of a sudden right above us. I, I, went, I had to run down and say, whatever's going on, please stop. And I'm doing but whether they, whether they can salvage anything from it. I remember, that's why I didn't remember it. I think it might be a, a lost cause on my end. <laughs> or did they just redo it at another time? You know? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they, since I haven't heard anything, maybe they were able to to use whatever was at the beginning of the end. I, I remember he came in with a pretty exhaustive setup on the table and everything. And by the time we got started, and then right about into the second question there was this mm. power about two floors up <laughs> i think it cancelled the whole thing but i i don't know what we got if there's anything there or not i totally forgot about it, it was one of those days they actually just made a trip over to uh, scotland and they actually went into paul's farm uh -huh. really producer yeah uh chloe and and her gang she had she showed me footage of it they were all over campbelltown paul's farm they went to abbey road you know they really did some uh some extensive research and they're putting a lot of time and effort into this and i have yeah, a, it's a big deal i think yeah it is mm. i hope that it tells the full story of wings and goes into detail with each member because you know, I think I told you that the, the first interviews I think I did with each of you, I probably said how disappointed I was with Wingspan because I felt like it was done right after Linda passed and it made the story of Wings be. I know, Lawrence, you said Paul and Linda's band, but it didn't give enough credit to all the other musicians. And certainly Denny Lane was affected the most being there from start to finish. Mm -hmm. It was almost like, you know, you, you were all extras in the band. And I'd like to see all of you be be given a lot more credit. Yeah, it was Paul's point of view. He did most of the talking and that whole thing. Yeah. That, that was my only... Uh, I, I thought he could have done a better job of that for Wingspan. It was just his point of view. Well, probably if it was done later, not so soon after Linda passed, I think that had a way of affecting... The total finished product there but that's just my point of view <laughs> but having the gift of playing with that man 51 years after i left the band yeah uh 
God smiled on me that day. I must say that's that's one of, that's one of my treasures. It, look, it looks it sounds great. It really does. I've enjoyed that a few times now. Yeah. That was just you and him, or was that with the band? Oh, with his band, with okay. his band, and the full stage setup and everything with. Abe standing behind me singing yeah. the high harmonies and, and hitting the button for the explosion at the end. And, you know, it was pretty, pretty insanely good, man. I'll never forget it. It's a treasure. It, it is. It's great. I wish I could see a video of that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's private for now. You know, maybe Paul will feel different about it one day, but he had mm -hmm. his, uh, his, his uh, photo crew in there and they were filming the whole thing as well. It's just that Monique took a little, my wife took a little video of it on her camera. And uh, I've sent that to a few trusted friends, I must say. Uh, but I, I'm really, a, you know, it was, what a, what a treat. I'm mm. checking my emails right now. You know, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to have to jump off. Okay. Into, well, we've, we've got to get, we've got to get the dogs into the vet. Oh. So, <laughs> duty call. <laughs> Nothing serious, too serious, I hope. No, it's just checkups. Okay. Well, Ziggy's had um, our fifteen-year-old little Ziggy has fifteen with. He's on more medication than I think anybody. Wow! Yeah, what kind of dog is that? What kind What's of dog? That? Um, he's kind of like a Chihuahua mix, kind oh. of a yeah. But you know, he's an old boy. That's a good innings. Yeah. Hmm. Well, All right. Well, I think that we we covered everything here in this interview and i can't thank you guys enough for doing this and sharing your memories of danny and we'll always be grateful for his massive contribution not just to wings but prior to wings after wings yeah. and uh you you told us a lot about him the man and for that i'll always be grateful so yeah. well great. thanks for doing this ken much appreciated yeah. okay all right Happy cheers season. guys okay, okay. Same move. Hey, Ken. Cheers, mates. And thanks to all of you for watching. Cheers. We'll see you soon. Yes.